How incredibly fitting. My interview with Carol Burnett, and there she is, right here in Hollywood on the corner of Franklin and Coanga, looking down on us in the neighborhood where she grew up. She moved here over 80 years ago, and now she is starring in a new series for Apple. Oh, I love it. And while this is my interview with Carol, it can also be considered part eight of my story location tour that I did on her. Over a year ago, I posted parts one through seven, and Carol actually saw them. She watched them. Next thing I know, her daughter Jody reached out to me, put me in touch with Carol, and then Carol invited me to her 90th birthday party celebration, which aired on NBC, and she sat me at the family table. Absolutely surreal. That then led me to launching my own podcast where Carol Burnett was my very first guest, and that is what you're about to hear today. My podcast, it's officially been launched, The Justin Root Show, wherever you listen to podcasts, and in episode one, you can learn exactly how this all went down. I talk all about meeting Carol, going to the party, making these story location tours, all of it, and episode two is this here on YouTube with photos and clips and, oh, new footage, because I have since learned from Jody, who was actually a guest on my podcast. Her episode is coming out very soon. But I learned from her that the house on Doheny, where she grew up, where Carol lived, still exists. In part five, I showed an empty lot because I thought it had been torn down, but turns out they just changed the address. So you'll see it here. And oh, for those of you who watch this series, you know that I had a burning question about Mama's apartment. Well, Carol answered it. And we are going to go back inside to this building here where Carol Burnett grew up with her kid sister Chrissy, their alcoholic mama, and of course their grandmother, who they called Nanny, and for whom Carol tugs on her ear. They all lived here at 6434 Yucca, six miles from the Peninsula Hotel Suite in Beverly Hills, where I sat down with my friend, Carol Burnett. Wow, it is happening. All here right. we go. All right. Well, thank you all so much. I usually say clicking in, but today, because you're here, I'm going to say thank you for tuning in. Right. I like that so much better. Uh -huh. Thank you for tuning in to the Justin Root Show. My guest today does not need the introduction. It is me who does. And because I know that 98% of the people who clicked on this clicked on it because they saw the name Carol Burnett. And I want all of you to know that I love this woman so much that a proper introduction doesn't even come close to doing her justice. In fact, I actually made a seven-part documentary-style story location tour on her that I'd love everyone to check out on YouTube. That can be my introduction. Oh, my God. I, when <laughs> I, I was gobsmacked when, I, when that was said to me. I, you know me better than I do. <laughs> you came up with stuff that I hadn't thought about. In years, really, yeah, you know. So I was so, so I was happy that uh, you know we could connect. Well, if you were gobsmacked, I need to come up with a new word for how <laughs> I felt when you reached out to me and even telling me that you saw it. And the next thing I know, I'm at your 90th yep. birthday party. I mean, it was your birthday, but it was my gift. I mean, oh. that's the irony. It just what and are you have you recovered? I uh, barely, <laughs> barely. Well, you know what we did. Well, they pitched this uh, quite a while ago, and uh, oh, I have to say, which is funny, sideline, we, uh, of course, first went to CBS, because that was my home. I think that's the one question everyone has, yeah. why it wasn't on CBS. Ask them. They passed. They passed? Oh, they passed. Are you kidding me? No, they passed. And I was surprised, because when we had done specials for them before, the ratings had been good. So I don't, anyway, so NBC reached out and they were terrific. They were so supportive. 
I think we got one note from them when we were in the editing room, just one. And they didn't nitpick or anything. They would, couldn't have been nicer. I mean, does CBS not know that they stand for the Carol Burnett <laughs> Studios? Well, I think maybe they're a little sorry now because we wound up being number one for the whole week. That is absolutely... Which was out of this world, you know. But the thing was, when we talked to NBC about it, I didn't want a birthday party with balloons and confetti and a cake. Mm -hmm. I didn't want all of that. Uh, I didn't want a roast. I mean, they're done to death. Yeah. So uh, what I wanted was a variety show. Like, you know, a show, some, an entertainment. I wanted a band, an orchestra. And at first they said, well, we can only have a seven-piece orchestra. And we said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> we want the the whole nine yards, yeah, you know. Okay. And so we got 19-piece orchestra. Fantastic. And, of course, all the wonderful performers. Well, I know it was just stacked with so many people, but you know who the most excited person I was to meet? Who? Your sister, Chrissy. No. I'm not joking. Oh, that's so sweet. And I don't know if you remember, but the first thing I said to you when I met you was, I'm so honored to meet Mabel Eudora White's granddaughter. Oh and you said to me, well, you're in luck. There's another one behind. Yeah. And I turned and it was Chrissy. And it was Chrissy. And I watched you two connect. And it just <laughs> I swam back in my trail of tears to my oh. seat. Uh, I, honestly, I mean, your family just means the world to me. I said in my story location tour that your book changed my life. I had to do a report on a historical figure. Yeah. And I picked you and my teacher said, no, 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 history. I said, well, I'm about to tell you her history. Oh. She's a historical figure. Wow. And it's not just my favorite celebrity memoir. It's my favorite book. It is just oh, so you. well written. And your, your, your style of storytelling is well, it's just phenomenal. It was interesting. I had a friend who was an author years ago. And I would tell him stories about Nanny, my grandmother, and what was going on here. And he said, you know, you should write a book. And I said, I... I did always want to be a writer, but I was more interested in journalism. And, and I said, I don't know about a book. He said, well, make it a letter. Mm. You can write a letter, can't you? And I said, yeah. Well, a letter to your three daughters. And start with my earliest memory is and go from there. And I, it totally freed me so that I could, I could write. It was funny because there were times when I'd be asleep and I'd dream of a moment, and I'd wake up, and then I'd turn the light on and write it down, and then I couldn't go back. <laughs> so then I started speaking into a tape recorder in the middle of the night, wow. saying, don't forget to write about the orange dress. Yeah. And then you know, put it, and I would forget until I played it back the next morning. Ah, the orange dress, and now I can write about it. So. I have a friend who has some wonderful stories. She's quite a lovely lady. She's a neighbor of ours in Santa Barbara. And I was telling her, I said, and she said, I can't write. I said, I said, can you write a letter? Wow. Do this for your children. Do this for your grandchildren. You know, they may, might be too young now to read it, but later in life, you know, let's let them see, as we said, what kind of a hairpin you turned out to be. Well, in that book you wrote, I grew up, on the corner of Yucca and Wilcox, <laughs> one block north of Hollywood Boulevard, but a million miles from Hollywood. Now, after being in that Hollywood for 70 years, mm -hmm. how many miles away does Yucca <laughs> and Wilcox feel? <laughs> That's right. That's very interesting that you would put it that way. Yeah. But it's funny, uh, not too long ago, we drove by mm. 6434. Yes. <laughs> And I stood in front of it, and we took a picture of the building and everything. I have it on my iPhone. And it said uh, there was a telephone number where you could call and, and rent, which I had done before mm -hmm. when I was right. writing the book. Mm -hmm. I rented the room that we I grew up in. but uh, So I, I called, but they didn't uh, pick up because I wanted to find out what apartments were available now even, yeah. and and how much money they were. A little different than your rent. $30 a month. I remember at first, when we first moved in, it was $28 a month. And then they ra raised it. And Nanny, my grandmother, said, oh, can you believe a dollar a day? 
we have to spend a dollar a day for rent? <laughs> she was, uh, oh, that was a lot of money then for do, us. Do you know my burning question about this is? Because you didn't put it in your book. What? Where was Mama's apartment? 107, down the hall. 107. Yeah. We were here at 102. Oh. And then you go down. See, here's Yucca. Yeah. So we faced Yucca. And then we'd go this way and then down. And 107 was here. So her windows faced Yucca. I, I, you did put that part that it, I knew that she had a bedroom facing the street, but right. I, I never knew which one. I, that Can you believe? I mean, of all the questions, <laughs> that one is the one that just thrills it's me the most. What a treat yeah. to learn that. Yeah. Now, I know you spent the first seven years of your life in Texas. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is there anything Texan about you? Anything you My can't... accent, uh, when, I, when we first moved out here, I talked like this, you know. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah, we had a... A nanny had a kind of an Arkansas, Texas mm -hmm. accent. So I did have a Texas drawl, but then I lost it once I got to Selma Avenue Grammar School and, you know, the third grade and fourth grade. But sometimes if I go back to Texas, I'll pick it up if I'm te talking to regular Texans. Interesting. They'll come back. Do you have any memorabilia from nanny? Any mementos from her still? Um, I have... A quilt. Aww. We call it the quilt monster. <laughs> and it's in my home. And it is as big as this mirror behind you almost. Okay. I mean, oh, not that's quite a... that big. But, and uh, I've had it framed. And it was started in 1700 something by a great, great grandmother. Wow. Yeah. And it's beautiful. She did all of it by hand. And it was falling apart. Nanny had it in her trunk. So, but I had all of the intricacies cut out and then put on a background. So now it's this big, wonderful piece of art. Ah, oh, that's absolutely amazing. Yeah. yeah. Are there any places from your early days on Yuck and Wilcox that still exist? I mean, I know Musso and Frank was around then. Probably a little too pricey oh. for you back then, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Right. But Mama loved Musso Frank and Frank. Really? Oh my God. And when she was going with the married man, yeah, yeah. they went there a few times. Now, here's it. Here's, <laughs> you're going to think I'm crazy. Oh, no more crazy than you probably think I am. But we finally, I got Mama's ashes. And we found where they were in Glendale a few years ago because I wasn't with her when she died. Mm -hmm. and, and, all, and so they had her at, at this uh, cemetery. Her ashes, and so I got them, and Chrissy, my sister, and I, we had the ashes. We went to Musso and Frank's, and we took some of the ashes and put them under a booth. <laughs> you did? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Because she loved that restaurant. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that is fantastic. <laughs> no. Yeah, we, um, had, we had those ashes, just, just some of them. You know, yeah. I had, the rest are uh, at Westwood Cemetery. Oh, that is the best. <laughs> we said we gotta gotta take Mama to Musso and Frank. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! That is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> are any of the old gang, Malcolm Asher, are they still? Anyone still uh, with us? No, yeah. I did see Malcolm when I was doing Friendly Fire. I remember that in the book. Yeah, Asher at one point years ago came to one of the tapings. Of my show. Mm -hmm. So I did get to see Asher, oh, but I don't know. We yeah, think it all be. Oh, course. Ralph Helfer. Ralph, who was uh, the animal trainer. Yeah. He's still with us. Okay. And okay. in fact, we've been in touch oh, recently. He's in Africa now. He's 92. And uh, I remember he, he would go to the desert and capture snakes. Oh. Nanny made a snake bag for him out of a pillowcase <laughs> where he could get the snake and then tie it. And he would come back to Yucca Wilcox in the apartment. He lived in the apartment. And one time he brought back a king snake. And all of the kids in the neighborhood were, wow. We would take it and it would wrap itself around our arms. And if we put our arm into the sun, it would tighten. Put our arms back into the shade, it would loosen up. Oh. Yeah. And then one time he got one called a blue-eyed racer. Ooh. Silver with blue eyes. But they, they kind of poisonous yeah. and it got loose in the building 
<laughs> oh, no. So all of us were looking for, you know, and it, it now the, you know, some of the doors in the building into the apartments, they didn't go clear to the floor. You know, there was a mm-hmm. little opening. So the snake had slithered under there to poor old Mrs. Wolf's apartment. Oh, no. And all we could do is hear her scream. And we said, oh, it's in there. <laughs> we knocked on the door. We went in. Ralph found it. It was under the couch. And she was jumping up and down on the couch. <laughs> you know, And then the manager said to Ralph and his parents, you, you're going to have to move. He can't do this. We're going to have to. So he stopped. But he became the foremost trainer of animals in the movies and all. And he used kindness training. Wow. You look him up. He was responsible for Gentle Ben, for Clarence the Cross-Eyed Lion. And I visited him uh, many years ago. He had Africa USA, I think it was called. And he had all these acres. He had elephants and tigers. Wow. He had a gorilla they were raising in, in the house. Amazing. And, yeah. And yeah, when we got up and we rode on the elephants and everything... And he, uh, he did a lot of movies. They would have him come and provide the animals. But he never whipped an animal. He never. It was total kindness training. And he was never hurt. I love that. And wow, Nanny had such a hand in that. Oh, His beginning yeah, days. Right. I love that. I also love that all of your schools were just within a couple of blocks yeah. of each other. And you walked to all of them. Mm-hmm. UCLA, not too far, <laughs> much further away. Yeah. But... Um, I'm curious, if you had to repeat one day in any grade, you had to go back to school for one day, what grade do you think you would pick? What grade? Yeah. Uh, sixth grade, Selma Avenue, was Mrs. Ernst. Mrs. Ernst. She was our teacher. There were 11 of us in the class. She looked like Catherine Grayson. Oh. That movie star, sure, you know. Of course. She was just, and oh, we loved her. And on Fridays... If we'd been good all week, after lunch, she would read us a novel. And I remember she read The Yearling. Mm. And she did all the parts. And I thought, she was a great actress. You know, later on, it was a movie with Gregory Peck and Jane Wyman mm-hmm. and all that. She was as good as they were. <laughs> I love that. I love yeah. that. I'll tell you who I would love to see get a documentary treatment, someone who is shockingly and sadly forgotten a little today, Mr. Gary Moore. I know. What a man. And I, you know, I, you've, you've talked about him so much and I, we know he how is. responsible he is yeah. for your graciousness and your kindness and just... Well, he was the first person that I ever, I mean, he was so wonderful to work for. And I think I mentioned this before that... We would be reading the script for that week on a Monday. And if he had a joke or a line or whatever, he'd say, you know what? Give this line to Carol or give it to Durward, who was also a supporting performer. Mm-hmm. Durward Kirby. Kirby yeah. They can say it funnier than I can. And so it said the Gary Moore show. But he always said, I, I want everybody to score. And that's what I wanted. You know, with, with my show, even though it said Carol Burnett, we had a rep company. I would support Harvey. Harvey would support Tim. Tim would support Vicky. Vicky would support me. I would support. I wanted everybody to to shine. And that's why it lasted eleven that's seasons. That's why it's yeah. And Mary Tyler Moore show was the same way. You saw her give it up to Cloris Leachman mm-hmm. or Betty or Ted Knight. There would be many scenes where they would be getting the laughs, and she would be the straight man. But hey, it holds up. That show holds up. Of course, there were moments too when she shined, but she was generous and that's what gary was i think maybe they i don't know people don't know him so much anymore because the show was in black and white you know thankfully we have youtube and that's true you know and again i mean oh my gosh i could talk to you for an hour on every single topic (laughs) i mean it's just it's crazy i mean so much happened on gary moore in addition neil simon who you called doc was a writer yes he was a junior writer he wrote come blow your horn while he was working on gary's show that was his, and Gary was his first investor. And Barbara Streisand made one of her first yeah. early appearances. Now, I heard something. I don't know if you would ever admit this, but I heard that when Funny Girl was in its initial stages, it was maybe brought to you and you thought, 
you couldn't. What get... happened was, it was 1962, mm-hmm. and I was on the road doing a show. So Jerome Robbins came to see us in Detroit, okay. and he brought the script. I remember we had breakfast in the hotel room, and uh, I read a little bit of it, and I said, this isn't me. <laughs> no, this really isn't. I said, if you want a star, you should get Anne Bancroft, because she could sing. And I said, or and if you want to make a star, you should get Barbara Streisand. Now, that's not because of me that she got it, because everybody felt that way about her. So, but I was just one of the chorus, you know, to say that. So, yeah. How absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Again, no, I, I would have done Andy Get Your Gun or Molly Brown or something like that, but not not Funny Girl, no. Uh, well, after New York, I know, again, I'm just breezing through because there's just so much, but I love that you bought Betty Grable's oh, house, your yeah. childhood yeah. hero. Your, right. Uh, well, I'm going to buy yours one day in Montecito, so it's <laughs> okay. just, you know, but... Uh, well, did, she, was, we, uh, she was a guest on the show, and... You know, and I told her, I said, we got your old your house on, on Doheny. I said, would you like to come by, you know, for a drink or something, you know, after rehearsal? She said, oh, absolutely. So she came over to the house and looked around and got a little cheery-eyed because her kids were the same age as mine then mm-hmm. at that time. And that's where she and Harry James and, and their daughters lived, you know. And Did Isla May ever get to see it? Just Betty Grable? The house. Oh, the house, no. Yeah. no. No, she never got to see it. Yeah. But Nanny did, right? Nanny did. Nanny yeah. did, because yeah. you had moved out. Okay, oh, that, yeah. I just, yeah. oh, I would, I can just yeah. imagine her walking around that house seeing right. you. Yeah. How absolutely amazing. Now, you have written several books. Four. Well, uh, there's a uh, fifth uh, book, and it keeps me up at night sometimes, because I, if I could thumb through Anything in this entire world, it would be the guest book from oh. the Carol Burnett show. I have to know where it is. Oh, you mean the autograph book? The autograph book that I have you would a have. Few. Okay, um, you there must have. I mean, eleven seasons. Eleven seasons. Yeah, yeah. summer in storage. Oh, yeah, I'm so glad you still have them. Yeah, they should be in a glass container right. with red <laughs> laser beams on it. It should be at the loo. You wouldn't want to see what Martha Ray wrote. Oh, <laughs> yes, I would. Oh, she was so funny. Oh, uh, and you had them. I love that you had your stars sign it on yeah. camera mm-hmm. at the end of the show yeah. when the credits rolled. I just Well, that was my deal when I was growing up. Nanny and I would go to the premieres on Hollywood Boulevard and hang over the ropes to watch <laughs> all the movie stars come in. And that's when I got Linda Darnell's autograph. She was my favorite mm-hmm. at the time. I was nine years old, and she was so sweet. I could still duplicate her <laughs> autograph. I could duplicate it. Wow. Yeah, she had beautiful penmanship. And she's the reason why you are so kind and generous to all well, of your fans. Well, she's one, you know, because she was so sweet, and it meant so much to this nine-year-old. Well, you know, you started the Carol Burnett show in a man's world. Sid <laughs> Caesar, Milton Berle, Jack Benny, and, I mean, you were told that you were a woman. Right. shouldn't do that, and those men are not mentioned nearly as much as you anymore you know it's so well, ironic maybe it's because they're men yeah and and you know so <laughs> we were the exception at the time yeah. now Dinah Shore had a, a variety show it was music variety mm-hmm. ours was the first comedy variety comedy variety there's a woman yeah and my favorite thing about it is just how well you catered it to your audience you were your own warm-up person and you yeah used a stage that would allow your audience to see the show without That was the camera. best studio in town. Yeah. Because all the others, I, I liken them to the Christians versus the Lions, where they look down on you, mm-hmm. you know. And I, I really don't like those studios. They're in bleachers. Yeah, it's awful. Whereas Studio 33 at Television City is a little theater. So the audience is there, down, you know, and... And the cameras never got in the way of their viewing. We had a camera over here, camera over here, and two way in the back. So they were really watching the live people doing it as opposed to looking at the monitors, which sometimes, you know, when you're doing the other kinds of studios with the bleachers, they can't see where the cameras are in the way, and they might as well be at home watching it on television. 
And I love how you 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 always give credit to you know your co-stars. You Absolutely. mentioned them and everyone behind the scenes and your writers. Is it true that you didn't always know which writers wrote That's rich right. sketches so that you didn't treat them differently? I think that is genius. How brilliant. Well, some I did. There were a lot I totally knew. Sure. Who created like the family. Jenna McMahon. Jenna and Dick. And, and, Dick and uh, Kenny Solmes and Gail Parrott mm-hmm. did As the Stomach Turns. I knew those. But then there were a lot of sketches that were submitted I didn't know. Joe, my husband, didn't want me to play favorites, but I did have a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always loved it when Dick and Jenna would write. Not only the family, but they did a lot of the great movie takeoffs. And uh, Rick Hawkins and Liz Sage wrote Gone with the Wind, because Rick, that was his uh, college essay, was Gone with the Wind, so he knew every minute of that film. Wow. So you watch our takeoff today... Everybody, of course, remembers the Bob Mackie curtain sure. dress. But if you watch that, it's the arc is there of everything that happened. All the major points in that movie are there, and they didn't miss a beat. <laughs> it's funny. Our Jody, my daughter, years ago, her she was at uh, University of Pacific, and they had remixed or redone um, Gone with the Wind with color that fixed it. So everybody went to the theater to watch it. And when she shows up in that green dress, the audience laughed and applauded. (laughs) (laughs) Jody could say, Mom, you've ruined that. You've ruined it. You've ruined that scene for everybody. Have you seen any movies recently, or maybe not even recently, since the show went off the air that you thought, oh, I would love to do a takeoff on that? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Not really. I'm trying to think. You know, we'd... I haven't really been going to movies that much. I watch series Mm -hmm. television, Mm -hmm. and most of the time I watch the serious stuff. I got hooked on Breaking Bad. Oh, yeah. And, of course, Better Call Saul. Which I, I, yes, I have that too to talk about. And uh, Big Little Lies. Fantastic. The Morning Show. Television is great. No, it's, it's, I mean, it's 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 always been. A lot of the movies in the past few years is like, you know, action stuff and car chases and explosions and st- uh, same yeah i'm not into the superheroes and yeah. i'm not into anything that has a sequel you mm-hmm. know I, I i just not but but back to your show real quick i love the evolution of the comedy you know you started off being this you know woman going gaga over lyle wagoner right. and then you just had these sophisticated yeah. You know, I, the pace is what I love about the sketches. They wouldn't get on the air today. I'm sure some executives would they're say too long. they're too long. But the character build up, the acting, it wasn't just joke, 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 joke. No. It was, you're giving us characters. My, I know everyone talks about Went with the Wind and all mm-hmm. the big popular ones. My absolute all time favorite sketch, you might not even remember it, but uh, you play a woman whose husband gets kidnapped. Oh, yeah. And you have to tell the news. and it, it, it's, it's one of my favorite sketches. Is it? Yeah. Oh, that warms my heart oh, so yeah. much. I Cause love it. it. It goes for forever before you get a laugh. Yes. I mean, it was a brilliantly written piece, you know, and I said, this is, if the audience sticks with it, the punch is going to be hysterical. Yes. Yeah. And it's so ahead of its time because it's a statement on celebrity. Yeah. And that 15 minutes of fame. Right. How do we appear on camera? She says, can I try that one more time? (laughs) (laughs) That's when the big laugh came. You know, which is my favorite line. And then you go, it was about two. (laughs) Yeah, right. Oh, it's so good. And there's also another sketch where you, you just play a sad woman who's gonna sing a song about leaving her husband and you tell him goodbye and you get in the car and it doesn't start oh, right and then you have to try to fix the car all while by the s- time i get to phoenix that was that one yeah those are my all-time favorite <laughs> ones where they're just you they build surprise it. you mm-hmm. yeah and of course we have to talk about the charwoman because my favorite thing about that i don't know if many people know this and maybe i did a little too much studying but <laughs> she doesn't have a name nope and the only time we really hear her is when she's singing. Mm-hmm. She doesn't have lines. Was that on purpose? I guess so. Yeah. The yeah. first time I did it was um, in 1962 when I did a special with Robert Preston. That was when the stripper, which was David Rose, had a big song. Not a song. It was an orchestration. 
da 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 oh and i remember i was listening to the radio and the dj said i love this term this is a housewife's favorite song okay <laughs> so i was pictured it what if the housewife is doing chores and that song comes on she could be sw sweeping and start to act like she's a stripper or ironing or whatever and then i took it one step further to make it into a cleaning lady in a burlesque house. Who, of it's course. after the show, and she's just got the naked light bulb there on the stage, and she's cleaning up, and she imagines that she hears the drum going. And that starts it off, and then fine, and she's got this old sweater on and all. We just did a mock strip tease to that, and it was her, her imagination that she was Gypsy Rose Lee. And that the band was playing for her, you know. So it just kind of grew from there. So it just never occurred to have her say anything. I love it. There's something so haunting about that, too. You know? There's something so haunting, that forgotten dream mm -hmm. or the maybe never made yeah. it. And right, yeah. I absolutely love that. Uh, of all the guests you've had and all the singers, you're not going to believe who I want to talk about the most. But Carpenters. Oh. My absolute favorite. They and, were so sweet. Oh. They were so sweet. And you covered some of their music yeah, on your yeah. album. I love your version of Rainy Days and Mondays. Oh, thank you. Oh, I absolutely love it. That album, and you did It's Too Late by Carol King. <laughs> but I, I, I love the clips of you and Karen. Karen. I mean, what a voice. Oh, oh, so beautiful and pure. So pure. So pure, yeah. Oh. They were very sweet to work with. Did you ever have aspirations to be a pop star or no. follow in your good friend Cher's footsteps? No. No? No. 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 Well, I started out, as sure. obviously you know from the book, <laughs> wanting to be Ethel Merman and Mary Martin, to be on Broadway. But I got sidetracked by television. And I realized, I never really thought, because I didn't grow up with television. I grew up on the radio, you know, listening to that. But when television came in, I didn't watch that much because I was going to UCLA. I know Mama would watch Ed Sullivan occasionally and stuff, but I didn't get hooked on television at all until I went to New York and lived at the rehearsal club. And on Saturday nights, I started watching Caesar's Hour. And I never even really watched that many show of shows. But Caesar's Hour, I would watch because it was available at that time with Nanette Fabre and Sid. And, all, and I loved it. But I still wanted Broadway. And then I got Broadway, and then I doubled on the Gary Moore show, and I realized when I got the Gary Moore show that I wanted to do variety more than I wanted to be doing eight shows a week, the same character. Because doing variety, I got to be different people every week. Different songs, different dancing, different everything. So each week was a new challenge, as opposed to saying the same lines night after night for a year. Wow, and you were probably so great at it because you didn't obsess over wanting to be in television. It right. probably freed you up. It, it did, totally. Now, of course, your friendship with Lucille Ball is one for the ages. Yeah. And we all love hearing those stories. And oh my gosh. And I mean, I don't know if everyone knows how deep your friendship was. I mean, she gave your baby shower for Jody. That's right. At her house, right? Black tie. <sighs> Really? It was men, yeah. Everybody came. She said, it's a black tie affair. Men came in tuxedos. The ladies, we wore gowns and everything. And there was hors d'oeuvres and stuff. And she was married to Gary Morton at the time. He opened all the baby gifts. And he was so funny. because He was like doing rickles on the baby gifts. So it was just, people were screaming with laughter. You know, when he was talking about booties or, or diapers or this or that. And so when the evening was over, the other men said, we had no idea baby showers could be this funny. It's much fun. And that was Lucy. It was her idea. I love your rapport on the interview with Dick Cavett. If <laughs> people listening have not seen it, I highly encourage you to watch it. It's just, it's just two friends talking. Yeah. Just two I friends talking. just got a couple of emails from him this week. Oh, he's... We emailed back and oh. forth. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. Yeah. I He's my number one... He is really sharp. Just a, I yeah. love how he just has a conversation. Just he's so great. Very good, yeah. I love it when I could do those shows 
when they didn't have to look at notes. Yep. And now it's all because you go on and you have to plug something. Everyone has, yeah. But way back, the best was David Frost and Murph Griffin. Yes. They never had notes nope. at all. And Johnny was great, but he was naturally would go for the comedy, everything, you yeah. know, and he was brilliant. But they would, it would be like you're just going out to dinner with yeah. them and having, having a nice conversation. Absolutely. Which I love. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if we'll see the likes of those kinds of with Well, mine. you're doing it, right? Well, I just love to have a conversation. And, you know, my, what's so great about being able to do your own show is I get to have the people that I want. And I don't, I don't have a producer. I don't have someone saying, all right, this week you're talking to so-and-so. Yeah. If you're on my show, it is because I want... You're the producer. Yeah, yeah, I am yeah. absolutely. Oh, I know that you know you're the queen of comedy and you're this iconic comedic legend. But I have to tell you, I love your film work, Thank and you. I love your dramatic acting. It is you're also one of our finest dramatic actresses. Oh, thank you. In addition, and I'm curious about Pete and Tilly because I know you've brought it up. I mean, listen to this. There was an Oscar nomination for Geraldine Page yeah. for Supporting Actress. Martin Ritt was Oscar nominated for Screenplay. I mean, that doesn't sound like a terrible movie, but you <laughs> kind of, when it came out, you kind of... No, I didn't like myself in Apologized in. for it. I know. It, I, I thought time, the movie was good, yeah. but I felt I played it too close to the vest, that I was, um, what I was, I was afraid that if I showed too much personality, they would think I was trying to be funny. As a result, it was a little too too tight. Well, has time changed that? Looking back, oh on yeah, it? I would, I would. No, but I mean, looking back, do you still feel that way, or do you think, wow, I was actually really well, good? I was okay. Let me put it that way. I don't think I was really good, but I had the greatest story about Walter. I was very intimidated by him because he was an intimidating guy. Looks it. You know, he was he was tough. He worked me you no know, fools. He was you know. And I remember I was just kind of, again, upset. I, I was thinking, he's big screen, I'm little screen. You know, television, big sure. movies. And at the time, he was very hot. He was doing two or three movies a year. You know, he was, everybody wanted Walter Matthau. So anyway, I was kind of nervous. And so after a, a scene one day, he said, okay, I'm going to take you to lunch. We're going to go to the cafeteria. Come on. And I went, oh, God, what am I going to order? I don't want spinach on my teeth or, you know, <laughs> what am I going to do? Anyway, so we're sitting there, and I'm hardly talking. And here he is, and he, so he leans over, and he says, so why do you do all this television crap? I, I go, whoa. Now, all of a sudden, I found a voice. You know, the hair went up in the back of my neck, and I said, oh, well, Walter, let me ask you, I said, you do what, uh, one or two movies a year? And he said, yeah. I said, are all of them wonderful, or could some of them you might think would be crappy? He said, yeah, some of them are a piece of crap. And I said, and it takes you, what, 10 weeks, 12 weeks to do one of those movies? He said, yeah. I said, well, look at it this way. Takes you 12 weeks to make a piece of crap, takes me five days. (laughs) Perfect. Well... (laughs) He howled, he laughed, I laughed, and then I realized he did that on purpose to loosen me up. He gave me my voice, and from then on, we just adored each other. And I worked with him two or three more times. Yeah. Yeah. Stellar work all, all three yeah. times. Yeah. And you also worked with my all-time favorite director, Robert Altman. Oh, mine too. Nashville and A Wedding are my two <laughs> favorites. I Again, that's someone else we'll never see the likes of again. No, I remember... When we were doing a wedding, Pat McCormick and I had uh, it was uh, these moments because it was uh, the Pat McCormick was in love with my character, and we were both married to other people. And so there was a moment, a scene where Bob Altman said, "Okay, we're going to shoot a thing where he's going to confess his love to you, and so forth." And we said, "Well, that's great." He said, "So go write it." He said, go, you and Matt, get together and figure out what you want to do and show it to me tomorrow. And if I like it, we'll shoot it. If I don't, we'll work out some some other way. And so, okay. So Pat came over to the hotel and we thought, wouldn't it be funny if we're dancing and I do all the talking 
and all he is is just dancing and lo- until finally he pushes me up against the wall and says, I love you, Tulip. And we wrote that together, and that's what's in the movie, that scene where we're dancing and Pat doesn't say a word, and I'm just jabbering on and nervous, and Bob said, great, okay, we'll shoot it. Oh. But he did that not only with us, but with some of the other people. He said, look, and he even said at one point, which I, you never hear a director say this, he said, some of the best lines in my movies have come from the actors. And when we had a meeting before we were going to do a wedding, he got all the whole cast together and told us what the plot would be. And then that's when he said that, if you have an idea for a scene or you have an idea that you want to change a line here or there, come to me, I want to hear it. If I like it, we'll put it in. And if I don't, we'll find out or do another way. That's that's what he did. He obviously loved he you. He loved improvising. He, he loved us when we did that. And he loved you because he had you back yeah. two more times. Yeah. Health is a fun movie. It's very fun. The cast is so fun. Oh, well, Dick Cavett. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what a fun, fun cast. Yeah. And I love the laundromat. Yeah. It's like oh, a play. Wow. It was a play. It was a one act. Yeah, for yeah. HBO. I mean, I... Yeah. Amy Madigan. So, yeah. And she, I think she won a Cable Ace Award I, she for She did. It. <laughs> she did. I, oh, well, here's a, uh, Ed Harris. Mm-hmm. You know, they're married. Yes. Ed Harris's father was a singer on the Gary Moore show. My mind is blown. Bob I, Harris. Wow. And I remember Bob and Margaret Harris. Bob was a singer. And at times they brought little Eddie to rehearsal. He was a kid. Oh, my yeah. gosh. How fascinating. Uh-huh. And you know, there's a bunch of people who got their... First starts in a wedding. Do you know John Malkovich? Right. Lori Metcalf, I think, right. was in it. I mean, all yeah. those Chicago actors yeah, yeah. who were there. And then this is a fun, a weird fact, but the house. Do you know pop star Richard Marks? Yeah. And his wife Cynthia Rhodes bought it and oh, lived they in bought it. That house. They lived oh in it. God. Isn't that? I it just needs love- air conditioning. <laughs> we were there in the summer, Lake Bluff. There's no place hotter on earth. I thought. The men who were in morning suits because it was a wedding, uh, we had to take salt pills and stuff because it was, and I had a wig. And of course, when you wear something on your head, you can't breathe. I was, oh, we thought we were all going to collapse, you know. But each one of we were assigned different rooms as our dressing rooms. So I shared a room with Dina Merrill, oh, you know, and yeah. then Mia and Geraldine were across the hall. We shared a bathroom. And it, all in the house, we were all, there were no trailers or dressing rooms oh. or anything, you know. But what a fun time. It was, it, a, it was like a dorm. And you ended up being nominated for a Golden Globe alongside yeah. Meryl Streep, <laughs> that little actress, I for The Deer Hunter. Did you wow, know, you are no, in the same I category? I don't remember that. Yeah, Diane Cannon won for uh, Heaven Can Wait, but anyway. Yeah. Oh, God. Um was there anything with Robert Altman that may have fallen through? Did you have plans to do anything else? Or? There was one time he wanted, uh, after he did the, pol- what was it, uh, not the politician, what was the name of that? that oh, um, yeah. Oh, Tim Robbins. Yes, the player. The play- No, but he did a thing where he was um, a politician. Oh, Bob Roberts, I think that well, may have been called. That's it, I think. Yes. Well, he wanted to do something similar with me going around the country, but as Carol Burnett interacting with different people of so and it I I, I kind of passed on it mm-hmm. I was nervous about doing that I didn't you know so so he was a little disappointed but we were still very good friends 1978 and 1979 actually it is such a perfect back-to-back year showcasing your stellar talent because the variety is you did the grass is always greener over the septic tank which was a riotous comedy. <laughs> And you also did Friendly Fire, Mm -hmm. which was the opposite of a riotous comedy. Mm -hmm. And another, I I think it's probably your heaviest performance. I don't know if you agree, but, and to to just go back and vacillate between that. And you did the 10th month. Oh my God, you remember that. Well, you know what's so funny? That Joan Tewksbury, who wrote, I I told you I love Nashville. She wrote that. And Mm -hmm. even Christina Raines, if you remember her, who starred in Nashville, she was in the 10th month with you. I just, I love those two years. Well, I saved my favorite movie for last. Um, It also happens to be my dad's all-time favorite movie, The Four Seasons. Oh, Just absolute, what a classic 
just a fantastic film. I mean, I don't know if we'll ever see the likes of that kind of movie you know, again. Just about. We were friend. stunned. Alan was stunned that it became such a hit. Like all these middle-aged couples, you know, what, who's going to care? And I remember we had a meeting before we were going to shoot, and we talked about it, and I insisted that we have a fight scene. Because in it, she was perfect all the way through. It was like they had this perfect marriage. So I said, I, I don't think everything is that perfect. You know, let's let's have some fun with it. And he said, absolutely. You know, so he wrote that fight scene for us, which I thought was good. If I were a real talk show, I would have, I'm serious, I would have an epic reunion with you and Alan and Len Carey and, Len. and Bess and... and yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you, Rita. And Rita, of course. I mean, that, that would be my show. <laughs> Ten people would watch, but I would be, we, I'd be having the time of my life. And Sandy Dennis, she's oh, one of my favorite she was so actresses. Sweet. Was she? Oh, yeah. And she was a cat lady. Oh, yeah, I heard she that. She had something like 23 cats. <laughs> yeah. And I made the mistake of when she had her final scene, I adopted a cat and gave it to her. <laughs> Really? She said, do I need another cat? And I said, well, then we'll, I'll take it back to the shelter. And she said, no, no, it's all right, it's all right. Then I got in touch with her later. She got in touch with me. The cat was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so I had another whole bunch of, like, four or five more cats out of that one cat. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> she wanted to kill me. <laughs> oh, that is absolutely amazing. I, I absolutely loved, loved, loved her. Um, we have something very unique in common, you and I, that not many what people can say. We both met Betty White playing Password. You in the early 60s, me in 2008. You played Password? You were the celebrity. I was a contestant. Oh, my gosh. I am the last person to have played Password with Betty White. Wow. They brought the show back with Regis Philbin in 2008. Oh, my gosh, and yes. she won me uh, $25,000. Oh, <laughs> Oh, well, she was a great player. She was a fantastic player. Well, you, you player. had to be good to win that. Well, I have to tell you, if I may get your permission to swear. Yes. I have to tell you what she said to me. What she said. After the first commercial break, I was really nervous. Yeah. And she said, sweetheart, are you nervous? And I said, very. And she said, let's just go win this fucker. <laughs> That's Betty. I about well, oh. collapsed. <laughs> But she, it was like with what Walter Matthau was doing. She knew what she that was that would doing. Get you. And it did. And it calmed you down. And after that, and I kept thinking, did Betty White just say the F word to me? <laughs> did Betty White just... And it was... It, I mean, you ended up being a close friend of hers. You guys went to her house for game night. Oh, yeah. I remember oh. uh, one time Fred Astaire was there. We were playing uh, charades. Yeah. Charades, charades Fred with Fred Astaire. Astaire. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, that's fun. Well, if, you know, if Nanny had been alive, it would have killed her. <laughs> to know all of this. <laughs> that, Unfortunately, she never saw... She did see me on the Gary Moore show. And she did see me do Once Upon a Mattress. Yeah. But she was gone before I did... Your show. My show. Yeah. But, I mean, to see Bing Crosby, to see Rita Hayworth, oh. to see Betty Grable, she would have... Oh. She would have been out of her mind. Well, speaking of Betty White, I kind of have a question for you because, you know, Gail Parent, who yeah. was a writer on your show, yeah. um, went on to do The Golden Girls. And, of yeah. course, Rue and Betty were on Mama's Family. Right. Was there ever any talks for you guest starring on The Golden Girls? No. Really? No. No one asked? No. no. Oh, that never occurred to me until just now. <laughs> really? That that would have been fun to be with them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you did Hot in Cleveland with yeah, Betty. Yeah, I did. But I just always wondered, why yeah. wasn't Carol Burnett on The Golden Girls? I love that show. Do now, you? who would have thought that a show about women that age would be a hit? Usually they want to, okay, you, you, now you've got to have a grandson or teenage grandchildren, to, you know, to get the demographics and, and the ratings for the younger people. They never did that. They never bowed to that. It was just pure comedy with those women they were just brilliant oh, so amazing yeah um, i'm skipping over annie because you've talked about annie so much and we all know you're phenomenal in it and i never get to hear interviews where you are asked about fresno oh way ahead of its time one of my favorites was it really i love doing that i thought it was brilliantly written 
a satire um, on the on, the on, soaps that were so big at the oh, yeah, time, like Dynasty, Dynasty and, and Dallas, that, yeah. Knots Landing, and brilliant writing, brilliant writing, brilliant acting. Terry Gar, I oh, mean, God, what yes. a just a brilliant actress. And Charles Chuck Grodin. Gro- and Chuck, yeah, Chuck Ch- Grodin. You did um, Grass is Always right. Greener. I said I played his wife, that I played his mother. That's but Fresno, I was brilliant, brilliant. You know the problem though, it was too long. They the it was six or seven hours, something like that. Mm-hmm. And then they put it up against, it was a very bad time slot. And it just, uh, it never, then they wanted to do it with a laugh track, which we thought, no, no, no. You know, When you have to tell the audience yeah. that it's funny, that doesn't but work. It, uh, I wish they'd re- redo it, re- not redo it, re-show it. Well, I have to say that I love the 80s so much because you got to work with your beautiful daughter, Carrie Hamilton, for the first time and fame and and hostage is such a hoot but <laughs> annette benning was in that. that's right that's and right her mother she was only in two scenes it was before she became annette, annette benning. benning yeah yeah, yeah. and that, i have to say that's what i do love about the internet is that we get to see these clips right. and we there's clips of carrie singing and yeah. you know i i just love how they've restored tokyo pop I know. Got it. Yeah, and they're going to show it uh, uh, at some theater in uh, Hollywood. I'll let you know where it is. That's amazing. Yeah. I would love that. You know, she fought, you're a trailblazer in so many ways. You were on the first Sesame Street. <laughs> Do you know? I mean, you were on the pilot for Sesame yeah. Street. Carrie was the first Marine in Rent. Right. On, I yeah. mean, this trailblazing family. Yeah. And speaking of firsts, your very first guest... Jim Neighbors. I mean, what a talent. What a man. He's a brother I never had. A brother you never had. And I love, you know, he married his Stan, his yes, Stan. lifelong partner in yeah. 2013, just a couple months after gay marriage yeah. became legal. Right. You always seem to have been so friendly and kind towards the gay community. It just never occurred to me that there was any difference. We're all humans. No, I don't pigeonhole anybody at all. That's just a wonderful thing to hear. And I think a lot of people need to hear that, especially in this day and age when I thought we were getting over everything and it seems to just be kind of back again. Please, she does an eye roll here. (laughs) I'll put that in there. I'll put that in there. Speaking of gay, I have to have you help me visualize a little fantasy. In my all-time favorite magazine cover which is you holding a chair on People Magazine oh, right. for Carol Burnett's Garage. So I may have brought it here for you to see today. Show, yeah. But in it, they talk about your new house at the time, which had a yoga studio yep. way ahead of its time. And it says that Paul Newman would come over and do yoga at your house. That's the gay fantasy thing. I need details. No, actually, it was only once. <laughs> That's plenty. Only once because that was when Joanne was a guest on our show. Okay. So I was talking to Joanne during the rehearsal and all of that, and I mentioned that we I had this little uh, studio or room, you know, extra room in in my house, and we do yoga every Thursday morning before we go in for blocking. And she said, "Oh, I'd love to come." I said, "Come on." So she brought Paul. <laughs> so we did like two hours. I had Lucy also one, and also oh. Maggie Smith. At one point, it was just when we had him as a guest, I said, well, come on over. And they, they came. Yeah. Well, I'll be there next week for yoga <laughs> at the new house. So consider me there. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite things you ever said was on the Dick Cavett show. You said that it's a hoot to be in show business. Too many people take it seriously. It's fun and it's pretend which I think just sums it up. That simple word, a hoot. Yeah. Well, that's what drives people to it in the first place. Then sometimes they get sidetracked into the business end of it, forgetting why they got into it in the first place. Why? Why? It's because it looks like it could be such fun. It could be a hoot. I love that. It must still feel like a hoot because you, you did... Just stellar work in Better Call Saul, I think. But I'm excited for Palm Royale, too. I... It's a dark comedy. Okay. It takes place in Palm Beach in the 70s. And it's about all this society, women, and Kristen Wiig. She wants to become one of those society ladies and how she tries to get into it. My character is the matriarch. She's the head of it. 
and she's got several secrets of her own, and she's not a nice person. Oh, it was fun to play. I can't play. And Ricky Martin is my boy toy. Oh, wow. He was wonderful. He's a very good actor. Can't wait to see it. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. And I had most of my scenes were with Kristen. Oh, yeah. that excites She's me. She's amazing. She is amazing. There's a, there's a scene where she, it's like a master class in acting. She's very serious. May, I don't want to spoil it and give it away, but it's it just, she's got to dust off the metal piece because she's got to win every award for that. She's fabulous. To work with those ladies, Allison, Laura Dern, I mean, that well, I'm doubly excited that I got a chance to get in the sandbox and lock eyeballs with them. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, so if you were taken to another planet <laughs> where they didn't have the arts and you were selected to show this planet one performance of yours and one performance of somebody else's. Oh, my God, Justin. I know. To give them an example of the arts, what two performances would you give? Wow. That's... Too hard. Yeah, it's a toughie because there's so much. Would you go to comedy or drama for you? Let me ask you that. Comedy. You'd pick a comedy performance. Com- and maybe music. Okay. A musical comedy something. Okay. Which was, of course, my original. Sure. And somebody else. Yeah. I guess it's a fancier way of saying yeah, who's your favorite. It's... Do you have a performance of someone else's that just is a go-to favorite? Anything Meryl Streep does. You know, yeah. but recently, more recently, there's a moment in Better Call Saul that Ray Seahorn does. I don't know if you saw it, but she's on the bus and she's just major uh, scene before that where she spilled her guts. So now she's on the bus and it's she's just sitting there and Vince Gilligan had the camera just pan in on her face, she's trying to hold it in, and she breaks down and cries. I, it blew me away, absolutely. I, I thought, she's got to win an Emmy for this. She has to, you know, it's just, just and Vince said he had her do it again after the first one, and he said she was even better the second time. She's just, was fabulous. That whole cast, that oh, whole and well, we, Bob Odenkirk, we course. bonded like crazy. He's I, my neighbor, not next door, but down the street. Yeah, yeah oh, I, I see him out walking all the time. I just love him. I love him too. Well, all right, I know that we have to wrap this up. So I like to end my show. It's very simple. It's called either or. You just pick one. Don't overthink it. You know, okay. just you know, right. popcorn or potato chips. Potato chips. Mary Poppins or The Sound of Music. Sound of Music. Singer share or actress share? Actress share. Who, oh, I love that. Hawaiian sunset or Hawaiian sunrise? Sunset. Marshmallow or caramel? Caramel. Coffee or tea? Coffee. New York spring or New York fall? Fall. All about Eve or Sunset Boulevard? Oh boy. All about Eve. Johnny Carson or Jack Parr? Johnny. Central Park or Times Square? Central Park. Uh, where you did the Harpo Marx thing, by the way. Oh, anyway, <laughs> Marlon Brando or Laurence Olivier? Oh, it's a tie. Okay. Santa Monica or Malibu? Malibu. Sue Ann Nivens or Phyllis Lindstrom? Sue Ann. Pickles or olives? Pickles. Peacocks or flamingos? Peacocks. Me too. <laughs> Madonna's pop music or Madonna's ballads? Pop. Have you ever met Madonna? Uh -uh. Okay. Uh, Romantic comedies or thrillers? I think romantic comedies. Fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. I don't know who wrote this one. Justin Root or Justin Bieber? (laughs) Justin Root. (laughs) Hey. Don't worry, he does. The other one doesn't watch. (laughs) Science or history? History. Gypsy or Sweet Charity? Gypsy. Oh, I don't know who wrote that. You're going to get mad. You don't have to answer this one. Conway or Corman? Oh, it's a tie. Yeah. Jay-Z or Beyonce? (laughs) Beyonce. 
LAX or Dulles International Airport? Oh, you know Dulles. what? Dulles. Yes, of course. An ocean view or a city view? Ocean. Lucy and Mame or Rosalind Russell and Mame? Now, I know you're friends with Lucy, but this Rosalind is... Rosalind Russell. Okay, good. <laughs> Elvis's music or Michael Jackson's music? Oh. That's a tie, too. Okay. Scrambled eggs or omelet? Omelet. Audrey Hepburn or Katherine Hepburn? That's hard. That's hard. That's a tie. That's too hard. In and out or Jack in the Box? Do you even eat fast food? No. I didn't think you did. Montgomery Clift or James Dean? Whoa, look over here. Yeah. <laughs> You've given all, oh my gosh, there's no right or wrong. I just, uh -huh. I love, I love this little thing. All right, the Good Times theme song or the Jefferson's theme song? <laughs> Moving on up. Yeah. <laughs> Jefferson's. <laughs> well, speaking of theme songs, my show doesn't have one. Oh. But if I did, you know, <laughs> I'd sing it to you, but I can't sing. So we're all blessed that that's not happening. I cannot thank you enough. For well, doing you, this. Let me let me say I cannot thank you enough. I mean, you've touched my heart, so really, you have, Justin. So, and I'm so glad that we could have this time together. Can yeah. you cry? This is a good thing I'm not on camera because <laughs> I don't need people to see my tears. Yeah. Thank you so much. Like I told you before, yeah. I I visualized this happening and, uh, since I was 15. So, wow. the fact that this has happened today, thank you so much. Love you.